You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 3rd, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, pulmonary function tests. Our presenter is Dr. Gary Salzman. He's a professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Truman Medical Center in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, good morning, everyone. This is the second hour of COLA for August 3rd, uh, 2020. Um, we have the pleasure of having um, Dr. Gary Salzman. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Missouri, um, Kansas City School of Medicine, and also the chief of pulmonary and critical care medicine at Truman Medical Center in Kansas City. Um, um, Dr. Salzman this morning is going to talk about pulmonary function testing, and I'll let him get, a, uh, get started. Thanks, Gary. Okay, great. Uh, so let's talk about PFTs. So these are some of the things that we'll talk about. So you'll become familiar with the physiological basis of um, selected pulmonary function tests. You're going to be able to distinguish between obstructive and restrictive disorders and be familiar with the indications of PFTs. So when we look at pulmonary functions, we, we look at the lung as a mechanical object and we look at volumes we look at flows, and we look at airway hyperreactivities. Uh, the other things that we can look at um, is diffusion capacity. Uh, and we uh, also, if we draw blood, we can obviously measure arterial blood gas. Um, but today we're just going to talk about um, the volumes and flows and uh, airway hyperreactivity and diffusion. We won't talk about blood gases today. So. Indications for pulmonary functions is evaluation of a respiratory symptom or sign. And we can determine if it's restrictive, obstructive, uh, mixed, or whether it's normal. And then we can quantify the severity of the impairment in a known disease uh, or evaluate the response to therapy. Uh, we can use this for preoperative assessment. Uh, we can use it for a disability uh, evaluation. Interestingly enough, um, insurance companies don't consider cigarette smoking an indication for PFTs. Obviously should be, but uh, they require the patient have some kind of symptom. And so uh, in order to uh, get approval for PFT, you have to put some kind of symptom down. So uh, that they have cough, that they have shortness of breath, um, they have wheezing, um, some kind of symptom is needed in order to, uh, to get approval generally of a pulmonary function test. You can't just put down, you know, 50-pack year history of smoking. Uh, that, that won't do it. You have to have a, a symptom, you know, or a sign. You can have an abnormal chest x-ray or CT of the chest, um, but it has to be a symptom or a sign. So just a FYI if you're trying to fight with insurance companies. So. When we talk about uh, volumes, we're talking about the amount of, of air. So residual volume is the volume of air in the lungs after a maximal exhalation. Expiratory reserve volume is the maximum volume of air expired from a resting expiratory level. Now, the ERV is an important number uh, because uh, one of the most common causes of restriction is obesity. And obesity has significant reductions in expiratory reserve volume, and that can cause a restrictive defect. So if you think about it, if you're just breathing normally in and out, at the end of a normal breath, if you want to breathe out in even farther, then you're going to see that the uh, abdomen is going to, to uh, come out. And so when you do that, uh, if you're obese, then the abdomen, the diaphragm is going to be raised. You're not going to have as much ability to uh, exhale after normal uh, breath. And so your expiratory reserve volume will be decreased. And so the ERV is an important thing to look at when you're looking uh, particularly at an obese patient who comes in and short, short of breath. The reduction in ERV would certainly go along with um, restriction secondary to obesity. Uh, tidal volume, of course, you all know, is the volume of air inspired or expired with each breath. So as we're all sitting here quietly breathing, 
uh, we're having uh, tidal volume. Uh, inspiratory reserve volume is the maximum volume of air inspired from the resting end inspiratory uh, level. Uh, inspiratory capacity, maximum volume of air from end expiratory level. A vital capacity is the maximum volume of air expired from the maximal inspiratory level. So uh, the force vital capacity is what we do with spirometry, where the patient takes the biggest deep breath in as they can and then forcefully uh, blows it all out uh, until they can't blow out anymore. Inspiratory vital capacity, maximum volume of air inspired from the maximal inspiratory level. Uh, functional residual capacity, uh, all the volume of air remaining in the lungs uh, at uh, end expiratory level. And total lung capacity is the total volume of the air in the lungs uh, after a maximal inspiration. So sum of all the volume compartments is total lung capacity. So this kind of gives you a, um, a view of what it looks like um, uh, from a, a drawing standpoint. So we can see that uh, you know, all the air in the lung is total, uh, total lung capacity. Uh, we have tidal volume, uh, it's a normal breath here, vital capacity. Uh, we have inspiratory capacity. Here's the uh, expiratory reserve volume here. Um, and then functional residual capacity is, is here. So this is kind of all of your volumes um, that, uh, that we're looking at in, uh, in uh, lung function. So, uh, spirometry, as you know, um, measures uh, not only volumes, but also flow rates. So um, uh, one thing is the FEV1 is the forced expiratory volume in one second. So that's the volume of air that's exhaled in the first second of a forced exhalation, starting at full inspiration. A forced vital capacity is the total volume expired during a rapid forced expiration starting at full inspiration. So this is the the uh, bedside spirometry that you do in your office uh, before you see uh, your allergy patient spirometry. So then we also have flow rates. Um, the FEF 2575 is the maximum mid-expiratory flow rate. Uh, it's the mean rate of expiratory flow between 25 and 75 percent of forced vital capacity. Now this has been said to represent small airways that if there's reduction in the 2575, that it may correlate with obstruction in small airways, where the FEV1 is more um, associated with obstruction in, in large airways. That's a little bit debatable, since the 2575 is uh, effort dependent. So someone that's not uh, giving a good effort may have a falsely low 2575, even though they don't have uh, small airways disease. But in general, I, I do believe that the 2575 does give you valuable information. In smokers, uh, the first thing that will become abnormal in obstructive lung disease and COPD is a reduction in the 2575. This will occur before you get a reductions in the FEV1. So reductions in the 2575 can be an early sign of, of COPD. Um, in asthma, we oftentimes see patients that have a normal FEV1 but they will have reductions in the FEF 2575, which may indicate uh, some small airways disease and give you clues that they do have uh, obstructive lung disease, even though their FEV1 uh, is normal. We can also look at reversibility in the 2575, and uh, if they're improved more than 20% after bronchodilators, that's a suggestion that they may have a reversibility in, in airflow obstruction from, from asthma. So the 2575, is effort dependent. It's a little controversial, but I do think it, it's uh, worthwhile looking at and trying to get an idea of the possibility of small airway obstruction and reversibility in small airways. The FEV1 FEC ratio is important. Um, it will tell you the, the uh, ratio between FEV1, the volume exhaled in the first second, over the total force vital capacity, what's totally exhaled over a full force vital capacity maneuver. And this is the hallmark for obstruction. Now, uh, the gold guidelines that look at COPD have arbitrarily set um, obstruction at an FEV1, FEC ratio less than 70%. And that's generally used in, in adults with COPD since most of these people are in their 50s and 60s. Uh, 
And an FEV1, FEC ratio of 70% is probably reasonable to have a cutoff for obstruction. But if you're looking at, you know, younger patients in their teens or 20s, then the FEV1, FEC ratio normally is much higher. And so actually you'll get a, a predicted ratio uh, based on the patient's age where you can kind of determine whether it's normal or abnormal. So instead of using this absolute number of 70, it's probably better to look at the predicted FEV1, FEC ratio and see whether uh, the patient is below that. So when you're having, let's say, a 20-year-old, you know, their normal FEV1, FEC ratio may be 85%. And so obstruction would be below 85 uh, based on their normal predicted ratio. So the younger people will have a much uh, higher FEV1, FEC ratio, where an older patient, uh, it'll be closer to that 70% that uh, is used for, for COPD. So that's something I think that um, is important. You just can't use this absolute number of 70%. You probably should use um, the predicted ratio, and if it's below the predicted ratio, then that would suggest uh, obstruction. You want to look at the flow volume loop, and we'll show a graph of that. And you also want to look at the volume time graph. So when you're interpreting pulmonary functions, there's several questions that you need to answer. The most important is, is the test even adequate? Is it interpretable? And that's an important thing. As you know, with any kind of data, if you have garbage in, you have garbage out. So if it's a poor test and it's not accurate, it's not um, valid, then we really can't make any um, conclusions based on that test if we don't have adequate data. So we really have to look at the, uh, the study and look at the graphs to make sure that the test is even interpretable, it's valid, that we can even uh, make conclusions from it. And then the next question, you know, are the results normal? So they're either normal or abnormal. And so that's one of the first things that you want to look at. Uh, and then what is the pattern severity of the abnormality? Is it obstructive? Is it restrictive? Is it mixed? And what does this mean for the patient in terms of severity uh, and uh, certainly management or uh, how they've been responding to, to, to management? So these are some of the tests that questions that we want to ask about uh, the test. So what is acceptable spirometry? We want a smooth, continuous curve. We want a good early effort, a rapid upstroke to a slightly rounded, sharp peak. We want time to peak flow to be a less than 120 milliseconds. We want to have a good end of the test, upward concavity at the end of the exhalation on the, forced, uh, on the flow volume loop. We want a plateau of the volume changed over time. And we want at least six seconds of expiratory time. Obviously, if the patient doesn't uh, adequately exhale and give an adequate force vital capacity, then you could misdiagnose uh, a restrictive disorder. Uh, because you're underestimating the force vital capacity. So that's a, a common uh, issue. A patient doesn't have a good effort, uh, breathes uh, markedly less than six seconds, doesn't have an adequate force vital capacity uh, that's not really representative of what their FVC is, and then we uh, falsely claim that they may have restriction uh, instead of maybe they actually have obstruction. So we do need an, an adequate expiratory time uh, to have an acceptable spirometry. So let's look at uh, the different uh, curves. So this is a, a flow volume loop. And so this is what we're talking about, a rapid upstroke uh, that goes to a curved peak flow. Now this number right here is peak expiratory flow, and it's 9 liters per second here. And you may think, well, that's not the same peak flows that we get in a handheld um, peak flow meter. And that's true because the handheld meters give you uh, a flow that's uh, liters per minute. And so um, this is liters per second. So if this is nine liters per second, if we would uh, do a handheld liters per minute, it would be nine times 60, which would be 540 um, on a handheld peak flow meter. But this is the, the peak expiratory flow rate in liters per second. And so it's different, obviously, than the handheld, which is liters per minute. But this is an acceptable uh, rapid upstroke a uh, nice smooth curve, uh, which would indicate, you know, a, a good flow volume loop, but it's acceptable. And then we have the uh, volume time curve. Uh, again, we have a rapid upstroke, and then we have a plateauing. It plateaus, uh, and we have at least six seconds. 
Now, some patients may not be able to breathe six seconds, but if they demonstrate this plateauing, that it's not continually going up, uh, then, you know, it probably is uh, an adequate effort. So in some patients, they may not be able to exhale six seconds, but like in this case, uh, even at four seconds, it had flattened out. And so this was probably adequate even at four seconds. But if, particularly in COPD patients, they will have very long expiratory times and their uh, um, volume will continue to go up uh, until it plateaus much later. Here the patient did 10 seconds, um, but you do have to have a flattening of the, the curve so you're not having continued increasing volume with a prolonged exhalation. So six seconds is, is really the, uh, the cutoff for an acceptable test. But if it's less than six, you would need to look at the curve to make sure that it's flattened uh, and they're not continuing to exhale increasing volume. So that's an, an important uh, issue. So are the results normal? And normal is re defined as 95% confidence interval. So normal range is in the range of values in which 95% of healthy people will fall. It depends on their height, their age, their sex, that racial and ethnic background. And uh, obviously we have fairly good normals for, um, for white individuals, for African Americans, uh, for Asians, but then you get to other ethnic backgrounds we may not have as, as good a data. But this is what we look at. Probably the most um, important thing is their height. And so in our pulmonary function lab, we actually measure the patient. We don't let them tell us how tall they are because that really uh, determines a lot of the normals based on their height. And so we have found that people really don't know how tall they are, and so we actually measure them in the, in the PFT lab. So the first thing you want to look at is the FEV1 FEC ratio. And again, um, you probably don't want to use that 70% that the gold guidelines use for COPD. You want to use less than 95% of their predicted, and the computer will uh, calculate their predicted ratio based on their on their age. And so if the ratio is reduced, uh, that would be obstructive. If the ratio is uh, not reduced, then you look at the force vital capacity. If the force vital capacity is uh, reduced, uh, then uh, you have a restrictive defect. If the force vital capacity is not reduced, then you would have, uh, it would be normal. So uh, the FEV1, FEC ratio is really the first thing you want to look at. And you want to look at what the ratio is uh, compared to what the predicted ratio is for the patient. If it's less than 95%, uh, then you have some kind of obstruction going on. If it's uh, above 95%, it's either normal, the force vital capacity is normal, or if the force vital capacity is reduced, it's restricted. So that's your first step in uh, in assessing uh, the PFTs is looking at the FEC, the ratio. So we also want to look at severity of obstruction. So we want to look at the FEV1. And if we have 65 to 80 percent of predicted, then that would indicate mild obstruction. Uh, 50 to 65 would be moderate, 35 to 50 severe, and less than 35 percent would be very severe. So this is kind of the severity, and for obstruction, it's based on the FEV1 to look at severity of your obstruction pattern. So in this patient, they would have a low FEV1 FEC ratio, and then we would look at their FEV1 to determine the severity of the obstruction. So FEV1 looks at severity of obstruction. Um, bronchodilator response is important, and we do that uh, routinely. Um, for asthma, it's, it's useful as a diagnostic tool, and uh, the criteria for um, bronchodilator response is an increase in FEV1 or FEC of at least 12 percent and 200 milliliters. And the reason that the 200 milliliters is put in there is that if a patient has severe airflow obstruction and has a very low FEV1, it won't take very much to get to 12%. And so that's why the 200 milliliters was added. So it has to be both 12% improvement and 200 cc's, which uh, identifies uh, those patients that even have very, very low uh, FEV1s 
they may increase by more than 12 percent, but they'll be less than 200 cc, so they do not have a significant bronchodilator response. Now, does that mean that that patient's not going to respond to bronchodilators? No, it doesn't mean that. Uh, it gives you some idea about um, their asthma. And we do know um, in patients that do uh, demonstrate a lot of reversibility, that correlates with a large amount of airway inflammation. So airway inflammation is correlated with the amount of um, reversibility. So if you have a patient with a 30% improvement in FEV1 after bronchodilators, that patient has a significant amount of inflammation in their airways. Um, what, uh, when we do this, if we don't see reversibility, that does not rule out asthma. Uh, you know asthma is an episodic disease, and so on some days they may de uh, demonstrate reversibility and obstruction, and on other days an asthmatic may have completely normal pulmonary function test and demonstrate no reversibility. Um, and reversibility actually uh, indicates that their inflammation is uncontrolled. So if I see a patient that's uh, getting therapy with anti-inflammatories and steroids, and they're demonstrating a very large reversibility, then that's a sign that their asthma is not under good control, that their inflammation is not being adequately treated if they're still demonstrating a uh, significant amount of reversibility. Once the patient's on uh, good anti-inflammatory therapy, then ideally the goal would be that they wouldn't demonstrate any reversibility on their um, bronchodilator response because they've had the inflammation under control. So uh, bronchodilator response is good for, for diagnosis of asthma if they, if they do show that. It also is a, is a tool to look at whether their asthma inflammation is under control or not because if they're demonstrating a lot of reversibility, the inflammation is not under control. And um, the higher the amount of reversibility, uh, the more concerned I am about the patient. So if I have a patient that increases their FEV1 by 30% after bronchodilators, then that patient, if they're exposed to uh, an allergen or a trigger, they could drop their FEV1 by 30%. So that is a concern if they're demonstrating a large amount of airway responsiveness. That would be a concern that their asthma is not under good control and they either not taking their medicine or they're on an inadequate uh, dose of anti-inflammatory agent to um, uh, prevent them from having this huge uh, bronchodilator response because with patients under good control of asthma, they usually will not demonstrate a bronchodilator response once they're under um, uh, adequate anti-inflammatory therapy. So it's good for diagnosis. It can also look at um, whether you're uh, having adequate anti-inflammatory uh, therapy. In COPD, we also see patients that have bronchodilated response. Um, it's about 20% of COPD patients. And those patients um, tend to um, behave more like asthmatics. They respond better to inhaled corticosteroids uh, than patients that don't have bronchodilator response. Um, and uh, sometimes there are overlap between asthma and COPD, but COPD alone can uh, cause a bronchodilator response. Now, you know, it would be very, very simple if everybody that has asthma had a bronchodilator response and everybody that has COPD had no bronchodilator response. Unfortunately, it's not that way. There are a significant number of asthmatics who don't uh, demonstrate a bronchodilator response, and then we have about 20% of COPD patients that do a demonstrated bronchodilator response. So it doesn't differentiate uh, the two, but uh, more likely asthma will have a bronchodilator response and more likely COPD will not, but it's not 100%. So what about restriction? So restriction, we have to measure the total lung capacity in order to uh, get a severity level of restriction. And in order to measure a total lung capacity, we have to do more than just spirometry. We actually have to measure lung volumes. So in terms of restrictive abnormalities, we have mild 65 to 80, moderate 50 to 65, and severe uh, less than 50 percent. So if you, can't, if you don't have lung volumes, if you're just doing spirometry, you can look at forced vital capacity uh, and look at severity based on forced vital capacity, but that's not generally recommended. If you're having restrictive lung disease, then you really should get lung volumes to measure uh, total lung capacity. So we do have different flow volume loops 
that uh, suggest different uh, problems. So when we look at um, a flow here, and we look at um, this um, this setting, this would be obstruction with uh, uh, you know a obstructive pattern. This would be normal, and this would be a restrictive pattern. And so we do have different flow volume loops that will demonstrate different types of uh, abnormalities. So again, this is obstructive, uh, this is restrictive, and then this would be normal. So uh, what are the different patterns of upper airway obstructive patterns? So we can tell from the flow volume loop not only if they have obstruction or restriction, but also if they have uh, um, uh, obstruction in their upper airway, extrathoracic, or in their intrathoracic, say, in their trachea. And so we can look at uh, patterns of the flow volume loop to look at a fixed upper airway obstruction, a variable uh, upper airway obstruction, or variable intrathoracic airway obstruction. So this is a flow volume loop where both the inspiratory, and this is inspiratory here on below the line, and this is expiratory, both of these are flattened. And this would suggest a fixed um, airway obstruction. And uh, with a fixed obstruction, um, you know, it could be a tumor um, in, the, uh, in the larynx um, that's causing a, a fixed obstruction. Also, it could be a tumor in the trachea that gives you this fist, fixed obstruction where you have um, flattening of both the inspiratory loop and flattening of the expiratory loop. So that's a fixed uh, obstruction. Uh, when you get to a variable extrathoracic obstruction, this is where uh, the obstruction isn't fixed. It's variable depending on um, the pressures in the, in the airway. And so this is a flow volume loop. So this is inspiration and this is exhalation. And you can see exhalation is completely normal, but inhalation has this flattening of the inspiratory loop. And when you have this flattened inspiratory limb, that would indicate a variable extrathoracic um, uh, obstruction. And what happens is the patient breathes in, uh, this will um, cause the upper airway to be obstructed, and you'll have this flat loop. But then when you exhale, uh, the exhalation loop will be completely normal. So what causes a variable extrathoracic obstruction? So one of the common things that we see uh, is vocal cord dysfunction. So in vocal cord dysfunction, uh, the vocal cords, instead of opening up during inhalation, uh, they will uh, partially close, and then you'll get this inspiratory strider uh, sound, uh, and the flow volume loop will uh, look like this. So this would be um, consistent with uh, vocal cord dysfunction. It also can be consistent with a unilateral uh, a vocal cord paralysis uh, with a uh, tumor that's not fixed, uh, that still has some movement uh, in the vocal cords, so a tumor in the vocal cord. So it is important if you're considering uh, vocal cord dysfunction as the cause of the patient's symptoms that you don't think they have asthma, they have more of a vocal cord dysfunction with the flattening inspiratory loop, it would be important that they would have a, a near nose and throat evaluation to look at their vocal cords to see if there's uh, anything pathologically going on. Vocal cord dysfunction is more of a functional problem. It's not a, an anatomical or pathological problem. So uh, it is important to refer these people to uh, an ENT physician to do laryngoscopy, to look at their vocal cords, to make sure they don't have a paralyzed vocal cord, make sure they don't have a tumor or polyp on the vocal cord that's causing uh, this flattening of the inspiratory loop. Um, common thing I, I see in, um, in my clinic is a patient who's referred to me for new onset asthma as an adult that happened right after they got their thyroid removed. And they never had asthma before, and they're having more trouble breathing in than breathing out. And uh, they have a full volume loop that looks like this. And uh, when I examine them, I can hear inspiratory strider over their neck. And the most likely cause of this is a damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve after their thyroidectomy. So um, probably every year I get a couple patients with new onset asthma after they had their thyroid taken out. Obviously they don't have asthma. Uh, they have vocal cord paralysis and they need to see uh, an ENT doctor. But that is something that you will see in your practice. 
So everything that has a flattened inspiratory loop is not vocal cord dysfunction. It can have other uh, vocal cord pathology, and that needs to be evaluated uh, and treated. Vocal cord dysfunction is really a, a treatment of exclusion, a diagnosis of exclusion, when you've excluded uh, other pathological problems of the upper airway. But this is a variable extrathoracic obstruction with flattening of the inspiratory loop and a completely normal expiratory loop. Uh, and then clinically, the patient would have an inspiratory strider um, with uh, this problem. So variable intrathoracic is fairly rare. This would be like a ball valve type, uh, usually tumor or polyp in the trachea below the, the vocal cords. So they would have a normal inspiratory loop, uh, but they would have a flattened expiratory loop. Uh, and so this would be um, obstruction worsening during exhalation and it causes a plateau-like flattening uh, that's really different from, from COPD uh, or uh, asthma, uh, where this is more of a, a variable extrathoracic, intrathoracic, I'm sorry, airway obstruction. And this would be inspiration is normal, whereas exhalation is, is not normal, right? So what about lung volume? So, uh, obviously, residual volume cannot be measured with spirometry. Um, and in order to measure functional residual capacity, um, residual volume is obtained. Residual volume basically is uh, functional residual uh, capacity minus extra reserve volume. So there's really a couple of ways to measure functional residual capacity. Uh, one is a helium dilution, and the other is body plasmography. Uh, helium dilution is used um, in some patients that have uh, claustrophobia that can't get in the body box uh, or they're too obese to get in the body box, we will use helium dilution. Helium dilution is not as, as good as body plasmography. Uh, basically, they breathe in helium and then they exhale helium and then we can kind of calculate what their uh, total, their FRC is. The problem with helium uh, is several. So if a patient has a perforated tympanic membrane, the helium leaks out and you don't really get an, an accurate uh, measurement of their volume. The other is in COPD, as you know, COPD has a lot of small airway obstruction and they have really large emphysematous blebs that aren't very well ventilated. Well, if the helium can't get to those emphysematous blebs, we're underestimating their lung capacity. And so helium will not give you accurate measurements in patients with severe COPD if they have a lot of small airway disease and a lot of emphysematous blebs that are not very well uh, ventilated, then helium will underestimate our lung capacity. Body plasmography really is a, is the preferred way of measuring uh, lung volumes. It gives you the most accurate measurement and then it will measure areas of the lung even if they're not very well ventilated because you don't have to get the gas into it. It just measures the, uh, uh, the volume. So this formula, you absolutely do not need to know. Uh, it's what they do for helium dilution, but you don't have to know that. And you don't need to know this formula either for body plasmography, really. Um, so um, the basics of this, the patient to do lung volumes, they have to actually get into a body box. And we have a, a pneumotachograph that the patient um, blows into. They have a shutter valve. And basically what we do is once we seal up this uh, box, we know the volume in the box, uh, we know the pressure in the box, and we can measure uh, the pressure in the lungs through this pneumotachograph, and then we calculate uh, the volume in the lungs, the total volume in the lungs. So volume and pressure in the box are known. We measure pressure in the lungs, and then we can calculate uh, volume in the lungs. Um, for diffusion capacity, um, we want to see how well oxygen gets from the alveoli into the, um, into the blood, into the um, uh, capillaries in the lung. And so we use a very, very small amount of carbon monoxide because carbon monoxide diffuses um, very readily at, uh, and it uh, gets taken up by uh, hemoglobin very avidly. And so we use carbon monoxide to measure diffusing capacity. We don't use enough carbon monoxide to hurt anybody, but we use uh, it because it's uh, uh, very strongly bound to hemoglobin. And the, the transfer of carbon monoxide to the alveolus, to the capillary blood, 
Uh, it depends on alveolar capillary surface area. And as you know, diffusing capacity can be used to differentiate, say, asthma from COPD. We know in asthma that diffusing capacity is normal or can be increased, whereas in COPD, uh, emphysema particularly, we have a reduction in diffusing capacity. Also, interstitial lung disease like sarcoidosis, pulmonary fibrosis, will have reductions in diffusing capacity, and it also can give us an idea of the severity of their interstitial lung disease. So uh, diffusing capacity is important. We use carbon monoxide uh, to, uh, to measure it. And uh, it actually correlates with um, exercise uh, oximetry. So a patient with a low diffusing capacity will likely um, have uh, oxygen desaturation with exercise uh, because it looks at um, uh, the diffusion of oxygen uh, through the alveolar capillary membrane. And if that's abnormal, that will produce uh, hypoxemia with exercise. So a reduction in diffusing capacity at rest uh, will uh, correlate with um, exercise-induced hypoxemia. So diffusing capacity is, is an important test that we uh, frequently use in, in different types of lung disease. But in asthma, which you're more interested in, diffusing capacity is generally normal or increased. Uh, you don't really need to know this formula. So what are some factors that cause uh, what are some factors that cause um, decrease in diffusion capacity? So low lung volumes. So that's uh, an interesting thing. When we look at diffusion capacity, it's related to lung volume. And we actually have uh, an uncorrected diffusion capacity and one corrected for volume. So the, the classical example is, let's say you have a healthy young man that gets a gunshot wound to the lung and he gets his right lung removed and his left lung is completely normal. His uncorrected diffusion capacity will only be um, a little bit less than 50% of predicted because he only has one lung. If we correct it for his lung volume, then we'll have a normal diffusion capacity since that remaining lung is normal, uh, and so the corrected uh, diffusion capacity is, uh, is normal. Um, so um, we do look at, at corrected uh, diffusion capacity. The other situation is in, in obese patients. Obese patients will have lower lung volumes. Their uncorrected diffusion capacity uh, will be low. But if they're normal lungs, then their corrected diffusion capacity will be normal. Uh, anemia can decrease diffusion capacity. We don't generally draw uh, blood when we're doing that, so we always dictate a disclaimer that uh, we don't know what their hemoglobin is, and so their decreased diffusion could be related to anemia since we didn't draw um, a blood count on them. If they just recently smoked, it can go down, and of course in COPD it goes down. Elevated diffusion, if they have polycythemia, if they actually have too much hemoglobin, if they have blood in their alveolar spaces, that will elevate diffusion. A high altitude will also elevate. Uh, so um, diseases affecting uh, diffusion, so uh, interstitial disease, sarcoidosis, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, diseases affecting um, the capillaries, pulmonary embolism, uh, pneumocystis, pneumonia will cause a reduction, and alveolar destruction from, from emphysema. And again, emphysema will have a, a low DLCO, where asthma will be normal or increased uh, diffusion. Uh, what causes uh, an increased diffusion? If you have mild congestive heart failure, if you have some uh, blood in the alveolar spaces, that can increase it. Uh, asthma, of course, we talked about exercise, and if you have a left to right shot. So oftentimes uh, we see patients and they're having symptoms and we do spirometry and it's completely normal and there's no bronchodilator response. Uh, but the patient is still complaining of symptoms and their symptoms may be suggestive of asthma. And so then we have to go one step further since we know that uh, asthma is an episodic disease and you can have normal PFTs. Um, uh, when the patient's not having symptoms. And of course, we're doing pulmonary function studies uh, during the day in the office when uh, presumably the patient's not being exposed to an allergen or trigger. Uh, and oftentimes, these PFTs can be normal. So if we want to go one step further and try to determine if they have asthma with normal PFTs, we can do bronchoprovocation testing. Um, several different things can be used. Uh, we used to have mannitol. They took that off the market. So now, really, uh, we, we only use methacholine. Some places use exercise and cold air. Uh, we don't do that. Uh, a few research places uses allergens. Uh, we don't do that either, or histamine. 
So really the most common commercially available uh, bronchoprovocation is methicoline. Um, it is important when you do a methicoline challenge that the patient's starting out with basically uh, normal lung function. Um, so we want to have a patient with normal lung function. If your FEV1 is already 50% predicted, uh, we don't want to give them methicoline and drop their uh, FEV1 another 20%. Uh, that could be dangerous. So we really want to start off doing bronchial provocation with relatively normal uh, lung function. And so with methicoline, uh, we start with a very, very uh, uh, low dilution of methicoline, the 0.05 milligrams per milliliter. Uh, but at the end of the test, we go all the way up to 16 milligrams uh, per milliliter. And uh, we measure FEV1 after each inhalation. And uh, a positive test is a reduction in the FEV1 or FEC by 20%. That would be a positive test. Um, certainly some of you have watched some of the methicoline challenges that we've done over at Truman to get you an idea of, of how you do the test. But the test is safe. Um, there's no late phase uh, reaction with methicoline. And so they, if they do develop uh, bronchospasm, we give them bronchodilators, and that usually um, will reverse uh, the bronchospasm induced by the methicoline, and, uh, but they won't have a, a later you know, reaction six to eight hours with a, a late phase. Now in allergen channels, they will. So uh, allergen channels challenges can be dangerous in that they could be fine in the lab and then they go home and six to eight hours later they can have a recurrent uh, reaction. And so in fact there's been some deaths reported with allergen um, uh, induced bronchoprovocation studies. So that's why they're not routinely done uh, in pulmonary function labs, but are done in, in more um, uh, investigational centers. I think they had a, a death at Johns Hopkins from uh, an allergen bronchoprovocation uh, study. Um, so we use methicoline, uh, and uh, basically it's a spirometry repeated over and over and over again. Um, before we start with the low dose, we do just like you do with skin testing. We do a, uh, a saline um, uh, treatment, so they get just normal saline first, just as a control, before we start giving them methicoline, uh, just to make sure that uh, they're not irritated by, by the inhalation of anything. Uh, and so we do start with saline, and then we, we start with the, with the low dose and go all the way up to the, the high dose. Um, so sensitivity uh, for methicol and challenge is very high. There's very few false negatives. Uh, the, the big issues with false negatives occur is when um, the patient hasn't emitted uh, their medication. So obviously we don't want a patient to take two puffs of their albuterol inhaler and then come in for a methicoline challenge. They're already bronchodilated, and that could cause a, a false negative. So the same thing with long-acting beta agonists. Uh, inhaled corticosteroids can also uh, cause uh, a false negative, and those have to be discontinued about two weeks prior to the, the challenge. Uh, Short-acting beta agonists, uh, usually we want to, to have them uh, stopped at least 24 hours before the, the study. Long-acting beta agonists, uh, usually three days. Just like you stop uh, antihistamines before you do skin testing, we need to, to stop their beta agonists uh, before we do methicoline challenge. Um, so specificity, uh, about 50% for PC20 of, of 8. Uh, PC20 is the dose of methicoline that causes a 20% drop in FEV1, and that generally has been defined um, as 8 milligrams per milliliter or less as uh, a diagnosis for asthma. But there are several false positives. Uh, allergic rhinitis uh, without asthma can give you a positive methicoline challenge. Cystic fibrosis, heart failure, COPD, smoking, even viral infections. So um, the reason that I order methicoline challenge generally is not to diagnose asthma, but it's to rule out asthma. So if I have a negative methicoline challenge and I've uh, held all the medications, it gives me a pretty good sensitivity that they do not have asthma. If I have a positive methicoline challenge, uh, the specificity is not that good. So it's it's not a, um, a surefire bet that they have asthma because they can have some of these other things that can give you a, a false positive. About 1 to 7 percent of the population have reactive airways, up to about 26 percent of smokers. So um, the reason I do the test is to, is to rule out asthma. 
Um, in terms of uh, other alternatives to methylcholine challenge, um, one of them is peak flow monitoring. So I can give a patient a peak flow meter. If they're saying they have symptoms at night or symptoms when they mow the grass, then they can measure the peak flow. And if I see a 20% variability in their peak flows, then that would uh, give me some information that they may have asthma. Another thing that I'd like to look at is if they've gone to emergency department, uh, what their peak flows were in their ER. So if they went in the ER and they started off, their first peak flow in the ER was 100, and then after they got uh, treatment when they went home, it was 400. That gives me pretty good evidence that they have reversibility. So every patient doesn't need to have a methylcholine challenge to diagnose asthma. You can use peak flow meters. You can look at uh, hospital records. Um, but it is important, I think, to make sure that patients do have asthma before you, you start treating them. Uh, okay, so here we got a couple questions here. FEV1 is 60% predicted, FVC of 80% predicted, FEV1, FVC of 60% predicted. So this would uh, go along with, with moderate obstruction. FEV1 of 45% predicted, the ratio um, of 100%, total lung capacity of 45%. So this would go along with restriction, right? So this is a severe restriction. Uh, with the FEV1 less than 50% uh, of predicted, total lung capacity less than 50% of predicted. So here we have a normal ratio. Uh, we've got a low FEV1, but we have a low FEC, and our total lung capacity is low. That goes along with, with severe restriction. Expert time of three seconds during force vital capacity maneuver with spirometry in the case, as you pretty much know, inadequate effort. So we can't really uh, diagnose, uh, put a, um, uh, a diagnosis here if we have only an expiratory time of three seconds. FEV1 is 60%, FVC of 80%, ratio of 60%. So here we've got uh, a reduction in our ratio, 60%. We've got an FEV1 is 60%. Uh, so then we have more of an obstructive uh, pattern of a moderate obstruction. Right. I think we already did those. Yeah, we did them. All right, I am open for questions. Anybody there? We're here. I think we're overwhelmed. That was an amazing <laughs> talk. Thank you, Gary. That was just great. Appreciate well, good. it. A uh, question I had for you about uh, doing pulmonary function testing during COVID-19, because there's been a lot of concern about after somebody does it, how long do you have to wait bef between pulmonary function tests? What do you have to do for the room? What kind of precautions are you taking when you're having your patients do pulmonary function testing? So we are being very cautious. And uh, because uh, pulmonary function studies are an aerosol-generating procedure, and we know that COVID is transmitted by aerosols. And when we have a patient doing a forced exhalation, they would obviously be uh, filling the room with uh, aerosol. And if they have COVID, then it would be probably in the room. And so what our approach has been is that all the patients that are going to get pulmonary functions have to have a negative COVID test within 72 hours. And then when they come in for their, their um, pulmonary function test, we now uh, have a negative pressure in our PFT room and so they're done under negative pressure. And so that's what we have done. That's obviously very um, conservative and very um, careful. But we felt that, you know, with the number of cases we're seeing in Kansas City and, you know, the uh, stakes are pretty high, that we're doing, um, you know, doing, uh, doing this. So we're doing a COVID test within 72 hours, and we're doing them in, in a negative pressure room. In terms of how long, you know, if you're not doing it in negative pressure, how long does the, the aerosol last? Um, you know, it may be, you know, uh, uh, you know, 30 minutes, an hour. Um, I think there have been different, different numbers. If you're not using negative pressure, if you're using negative pressure, it evacuates it much faster. faster. Yeah, since we don't have negative pressure in our pulmonary function room, they've been having us wait an hour between tests, which means for an entire hour we can't use that room, which has really limited our ability to, to do pulmonary function tests. Yeah, you know, we, I thought negative pressure was a big deal, but um, they came in and they, uh, they worked for a couple days and uh, they made our PFT room into a negative pressure room. 
Um, so that, you know, that kind of solved that problem. But, you know, that, and then, uh, you know, we also decided that we were going to test everybody that was scheduled for, for spirometry before they came in. So we're actually doing, doing two different things. I don't know if that's overkill or not, but uh, that's that's what we're doing. But um, you know that it is uh, you know a potential way to transmit COVID by doing a forced exhalation. Yep. Gary, this is Paul. Um, for the scheduling for the COVID patients, has that been a, an issue or a problem to be able to get them scheduled so they could have results back before they came into clinic? No, we we're right now our our turnaround time at Truman is about 24 to 48 hours, and so we're we're doing them enough in advance that they go to the hut. We have a little drive-through hut where they get their test done, and we haven't had any problem getting the results back, you know, before they're scheduled. And we're we're doing it 72 hours uh, prior to um, to the test so that we can get you know we can get the results back because uh, it's 24 to 48 hours, but we get another you know, 72 hours to a leeway. But we, we've we been able to, to do it. Now, obviously, we're doing markedly less PFTs than we did previously. We're doing them on a, you know, more selective basis. But, uh, you know, we're, we're able to, to get them done and uh, and get and get results. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's obviously a much bigger deal for patients. They have to get uh, COVID testing uh, prior to coming in for their PFTs. Anybody else have any questions for Dr. Seldman before we end this morning? Um, if not, then um, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Salzman for giving a great talk um, and for taking the time to do this out of his busy schedule. Um, um, you have a great week, Gary, and um, keep safe. All right. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye.